Hey, it's Dr. Astar Bear, and in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the class structure of agriculture in the Soviet Union. So a lot of my thinking on this topic uh, is influenced by the work of Resnick and Wolf, uh, especially uh, their 2002 book called Class Theory and History, Capitalism and Communism in the USSR. So Marxism uses class as its entry point to understand the economy and society. And uh, of course, there are a lot of different versions of class analysis, uh, even within Marxism. Uh, the one that I use that I think is the most uh, comprehensive and logical and most true to Marx's own method uh, is uh, the one that uses five fundamental class processes that, that defines class as uh, the relationship between the producer uh, of surplus labor and the appropriator and others in society. So based on that relationship, uh, we can construct these these different fundamental class processes. Uh, the red ones are exploitative, okay, so feudal fundamental class process, slave fundamental class process, capitalist fundamental class process. These involve others uh, taking the surplus, that is, the non-producers are, are appropriating the surplus in all these cases. Uh, and Marxism, of course, has a very strong commitment to minimizing and eventually abolishing that exploitation altogether from society. Uh, there are two uh, class processes that do not involve that, right? The, the producers themselves, either individually, in the case of the ancient fundamental class process, also sometimes called uh, petty bourgeois or independent commodity production, called various things, uh, and the communal fundamental class process, both of these involve the workers themselves appropriating their own surplus, either individually or collectively. Okay, so let's consider how has the class structure changed uh, in agriculture uh, over the course of uh, Soviet history? That is, in other words, let's consider the class transitions that have occurred. So the first is the abolition of feudalism, the feudal fundamental class process, which you know, has lords and serfs and the complex ties of, of loyalty and obligation uh, between these uh, these groups with the, the serfs, of course, performing the necessary and surplus labor and the lords appropriating it. Uh, but in a certain, with a certain constellation of, of relationships, you know, there's, there's legal and political and, and cultural conditions of existence which create this uh, and this is what dominates agriculture uh, in in Russia for hundreds of years. Um, but it ends with the emancipation of the serfs, which occurs in 1861. So uh, right around the same time that slavery is being abolished uh, in the United States, uh, the serfs are, are emancipated a few years before, are, are being emancipated. And this eliminates the corvée system. They had a very brutal form of that where the, it's, it's even kind of debatable whether this was actually slavery or feudalism. The, the slaves uh, could actually be transferred to others. Uh, so, you know, they, it, has, it has a bit of that ownership relationship. And anyway, this, this kind of, of, uh, of class process uh, is, ends in, in 1861, and that ushers in, uh, in one class transition that occurs. So what happens then is we have the ancient fundamental class process, that is, the, the, the peasant farmers go from being serfs to being tenants. Um, uh, they, they have to pay rent. Um, in fact, the state, uh, the czarist state, actually pays the feudal lords. They, they get redemption payments. Uh, for, to compensate them for the loss of the, the core labor system. Quite incredible. Uh, so the, the, the farmers are heavily taxed. They, they have to still have to pay rent. Uh, they are hit hard by inflation. You know, farmers often suffer because of inflation because, you know, while in theory uh, a rise in prices should be neutral from the perspective of, of a farmer or a commodity producer. Uh, you know, that is, the rise in price of their output should be the same as the rise in price of, you know, their inputs and their consumption goods, in theory, right? But 
the the problem with that, of course, is that agriculture, you know, you're not producing something every day, right? I mean, agriculture has a cycle, you know, you you don't typically harvest every single day. I mean, you know, maybe maybe with some things you do, but typically, and for lots of agricultural goods, the harvest is maybe once, twice, maybe three times a year at most, right? So the, you're going to suffer from the, the rise in, in prices that occurs at any other time of the year, right? And so there may be long, you know, significant portions of the year where you're hurt by inflation, right? Now, also, agricultural productivity is quite low. Uh, investment in new technology is very limited. Uh, it's very difficult. You know, the, the, the former serfs, the freed serfs, um, don't have any the way to accumulate capital, right? They don't, they don't have the means to, to invest. They don't have they have very limited access uh, to loans and so forth. Okay, so I, I've discussed uh, the Bolshevik Revolution and the aftermath of that, the, the civil war uh, that occurs. In terms of how this affects agriculture, we have, you know, the, the, um, what the Bolsheviks call their, what, what happens at this point is they call it war communism, right? Meaning, listen, this is an emergency situation. Uh, it's going to put a lot of different demands on society, right? The, the, uh, and it, it indeed does place huge demands on the ancient fundamental class process in agriculture. All the surplus is requisitioned uh, you know, from, the, from these farmers uh, in order to feed soldiers and urban workers and so forth. Uh, and the standard of living uh, and productivity fall in agriculture. There's a lot of tensions and revolts and uprisings, a very chaotic moment. And of course, you know, it's accompanied by the whole struggle to determine, you know, the political future uh, of the country, which is very much in doubt, right? It's not at all clear that the Bolsheviks are going to win the Russian Civil War. Uh, however, they do. And after that, then we we uh, enter the, the next period, which is the period of a new economic policy, uh, which ends requ requisitioning. Uh, but there's still a struggle there between uh, this ancient fundamental class process in agriculture uh, and the, the newly formed state capitalist fundamental class process in industry. And that struggle is over the distribution of the surplus. It, the way that it manifests is through the state-administered terms of trade between agriculture and industry uh, manufacturing. So that is, what are the prices, you know, since all of the, the prices are, are essentially set by the state, right? The way that they set prices has a big impact on the value flows uh, between these different sectors of the economy. So when, when, when we say that the, the struggle takes place through the terms of trade, what that means is the prices are set rather high for raw materials and rather low for output. And that's a conscious decision uh, on the part of the central authorities. The next big uh, class transition that occurs uh, in agriculture uh, is the collectivization uh, under Stalin. You know, at this point, Lenin has died. Um, and collectivization is a massive shift uh, which, which basically ends... Uh, the the ancient fundamental class process it it ends the the widespread situation that had a, that had been in place since the emancipation of the serfs uh, you know these these small tenant farms uh, or peasant farms so collectivization um, it, it, you know moves towards large scale farms and totally changes the distribution of land it changes a lot of things in the countryside. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, t you know, just tumult uh, in the society as a result of that. And, and it also happens very, very quickly. So let's look at, in class terms, the, the state's revenue and expenditures here. Okay, so, it, you know, the, the Bolsheviks, the, the, the Soviet state here, um, they have revenue. Part of that they get from... Uh, enterprises, right? It's because the state is now the the owner of, especially in manufacturing, right? They're the owner of the capital and all the means of production, uh, and they're very, very focused on uh, rapidly industrializing the country. So they they are in a position to appropriate surplus 
from what they call and what they consider to be state capitalist enterprises, right? So now I'm not saying that as some kind of uh, pejorative, right? This is this is how it is understood at the time. You know, the the thinking is before we can really achieve communism or or even socialism, we need to develop the economy and the way to do that rapidly uh, is through having one employer, um, and you know we're still paying wages, but you know we, and it was even acknowledged at times that that uh, that that single employer, uh, you know, was taking the surplus to a very limited extent. That's admitted, right? But but on behalf of the workers, that's what's new, right? So um, so they receive a. Uh, you know, a portion here, surplus value from these enterprises. They also get subsumed class revenue, okay, from the surpluses of, you know, capitalist ancient and feudal class processes for continuing the, you know, providing the conditions of existence uh, to allow these fundamental class processes to occur, okay? So a the ancient fundamental class process is not the only thing going on in, in agriculture. There are, there is, you know, small capitalism they're developing. So that is, some farmers, having become more prosperous, uh, hire agricultural labor and pay them a wage, right? They are small capitalists. Um, and that's one of the things that the, the Bolsheviks grapple with, uh, the Soviets grapple with. Um, they also get a non-class revenue from other sources, that is, taxes on workers' wages, uh, on, on businesses, earnings, subsumed class re revenues, etc. Okay, so, you know, this is a, a, a general kind of formula here for, for revenue and expenditure. Um, if we look at what are their expenditures, uh, you know, whenever you appropriate surplus, you have a set of subsumed class payments. Okay, that's this this term here, subsumed class payments. That is distributions of the surplus that secure the conditions of existence which make it possible to appropriate that surplus. Okay, then you have you have uh, payments which are known as X. So these payments are necessary to secure the subsumed class revenue. Uh, so, for example, I mentioned law enforcement. All of the costs of law enforcement would go here. Uh, and then Y would be payments necessary to secure the non-class revenue. For example, tax collection, uh, all the costs associated with that. Okay, so like I mentioned back to new economic policy, right, that, that ends requisitioning that, that had occurred under war communism. Uh, reintroduces markets uh, to agriculture, but with prices very carefully controlled by the state. So the conflict, right, we, we, we're back to talking about the terms of trade between agriculture and industry here. Um, the conflict that the that the state has is, you know, how should they set prices? Now that they're, they've, you know, they have reintroduced markets in agriculture, what should the prices of, for example, agricultural products, foodstuffs, and you know some of the the output of agriculture is not food, but but rather inputs for other things, um, inputs for for industry. Uh, here's the thing, right? If they if they raise the prices of, of agricultural products, uh, they're going to create or increase incentives for the ancient and capitalist farmers in agriculture to increase production for the market. You know that is that that's mainstream economic theory right there, which the the Soviets, uh, you know, were well aware of. The Soviets actually had many, many economists uh, on their payroll. They they were probably better informed uh, on economic theory than really any other state at the time. I mean, uh, in terms of just the sheer number of of economists that they hired. Um, uh, however, it's also going to lead to at the same time lower living standards for workers uh, in industry. Right? That is. You know the the higher prices for output is going to lead to higher prices for all of the products that you know rely on those inputs. So you know that that's going to require additional surplus that goes to the workers uh, to enable them to to buy that you know the the necessary things for their standard of living, right? So so that's those are the pros and cons of raising agricultural prices. Well, what if they were to lower it, right? Well, if they lower it, there's more surplus available to invest in growing industry. But, however, the downside of that is that there's going to be lower living standards for farmers, right? There's going to be probably less agricultural production. But this is what the state chose, right? They, again, they were aware of the pros and cons. You know, it's it's sort of fashionable to say that the 
the uh, the Soviets uh, didn't understand basic economics or something. That's not correct, right? They had they had a lot of debates uh, uh, internally uh, about how to do price setting, uh, and they were well aware of the law of demand and other and the law of supply, right? They were they were well aware of that. So here's uh, Stalin. Here's how Stalin uh, discusses these these choices. Okay, so. He, he says, although agriculture as a whole had passed the pre-war level, the gross yield of its most important branch, grain growing, was only 91% of pre-war. So at the, at the point that he's discussing, this is you know, during the, the new economic policy, and he's discussing the precursors or what led to collectivization. Um, while the marketed share of harvest, that is the amount of grain sold for the supply of the towns, scarcely attained a 37% of the pre-war figure. Furthermore, all the signs pointed to a danger of further decline in the amount of marketable grain. So the Soviets were very, very focused on grain, right? Grain uh, is, you know, the easiest thing to, uh, to transport, uh, to store, um, uh, you know, r relatively high uh, calorie per unit. Um, you know, it's the, it's the uh, most non-perishable uh, food stuff. Uh, so this meant that the process of splitting up of the large farms that used to produce for the market into small farms and of the small farms into dwarf farms, uh, that doesn't mean they grow dwarfs, it just means they're very small, you know. <laughs> uh, a process which had begun in 1918 was still going on, that these small and dwarf peasant farms were reverting practically to a natural form of economy and were able to supply only a negligible quantity of grain for the market. There could be no doubt that if such a state of affairs in grain farming were to continue, the army and the urban population would be faced with chronic famine. So they were very, very focused on this, right? How do they meet the needs of the entire populace, but particularly the, the, the urban centers, which of course grow no food of their own, right? No city uh, there's just not enough land to support, uh, you know, within the city, right, to support that kind of population density. It has to be supported uh, from the countryside. Every city does, right? So they're, they're very concerned with how do they manage that. So uh, Stalin continues, uh, the only escape from this predicament was to change to large-scale farming, which would permit the use of tractors and agricultural machines and secure a several-fold increase of the marketable surplus of grain. The country had the alternative either to adopt large-scale capitalist farming, which would have meant the ruin of the peasant masses, destroyed the alliance between the working class and the peasantry, increased, increased the strength of the kulaks, more on that term in a sec, um, and led to the downfall of socialism in the countryside, or to take the course of amalgamating the small peasant holdings into large socialist farms, collective farms which would be able to use tractors and other modern machines for a rapid advancement of grain farming and a rapid increase in the marketable surplus of grain. So this is how Stalin uh, summarizes it, uh, you know, the, their dilemma, uh, you know, of the, of the Soviets at, at this point. So, uh, of course, what they chose was uh, the, the second route, right, the, the collectivization. Um, and this occurs over a period of time. Uh, but most of it actually occurs within the first few years. So let's just define, you know, what, what was collectivization. What it meant was removing these ancient and small capitalist farmers from their small farms and forming large-scale collective uh, farming enterprises. Um, and, you know, this is probably the most rapid and profound transformation of agriculture probably in any society in history. I mean, you know, there's just the, the sheer speed with which this was done, and it's a vast, vast reorganization. You know, other societies had, you know, abolished the corvée. This happened uh, in the rest of Europe much earlier in the, in the 14th century. Uh, but there wasn't much change in terms of the distribution of land or the organization of, of agriculture. That didn't really change by changing the law, right? You, you have to change a lot more than just one law uh, in order to, to get the kind, these kinds of changes to happen, right? These are big, big changes. So the, the collective farms uh, had hundreds of collective members, uh, and in terms of class, 
the the evidence suggests that they were the communal fundamental class process. That is, the workers themselves who produced also appropriated the surplus. Um, so very interesting, right? These are large scale uh, communal firms. Um, very very interesting. Uh, so let's look at the results of this. I mean, this is this is remarkable, right? It, it means that the communal firms represent the first large-scale modern instance of abolishing exploitation in a part of the economy that had traditionally been very highly exploitative. Uh, now, you know, like any huge change, right? Some are going to support it and some not. Uh, a lot of peasants did support uh, this, but Others were upset, you know, it, it maybe it, it meant just because it was a change, it was unknown. For some, it meant the loss of wealth and privilege. Uh, and there were a great many protests over collectivization. Uh, the Soviets certainly saw that as being led by, uh, you know, the richer peasants. Um, so, and this, this caused a, a lot of problems. So the farmers, of course, had different levels of income and wealth, which I, which I mentioned, right? The the uh, the Soviets broke them into three basic classes, uh, and said, you know, the, there's poor peasants, which look like this. This is from a, a Soviet illustration from the 1920s. Uh, the the bedniaks, right, poor peasants. Um, so here here they are, and here's what they have, right? Not very much, right? Um, here's the uh, serednyaks, uh, the middle income peasants, right? You can see they have a bit more. They have a horse here, you know. It's a, uh, maybe slightly bigger house or whatever, see they have a porch. Uh, and then there's the kulaks, the, the rich peasants, uh, many of whom were also small capitalists, right? And you can see, um, you know, they have they have more, they have a you know, much better house and so forth. And now let's look at how did state policy both support and undermine these collective farms. Um, so the state had policies and enforcement, which of course created the collective farms, uh, and they were given output quotas to produce and be sold to the state at state-administered prices. So the, the prices that they got for their output were not, were not free market prices, right? They were controlled prices. Um, and in a lot of cases, these were below the market value of the output. So again, it's a conscious choice that the central authorities made uh, to, you know, siphon surplus out of uh, the countryside and use it. Uh, to accumulate uh, in, you know, in industry, to, to turbocharge the development of, of industry. Um, that's the whole point of it, right? They, they, and they were very explicit about that, right? We need to rapidly develop. We need to rapidly industrialize. Agriculture is the foundation of that, okay? Now, in class terms, okay, whenever there's a struggle over the surplus, this is class conflict, right? Now, the Soviets did not see their society as having class conflict because, you know, they said, well, we have a dictatorship of the proletariat. We don't, we don't have class conflict anymore. We, we don't have, um, you know, we don't have capitalist versus workers. We don't have that, right? Um, so that's true, right? They have something different, but there's still a struggle over the surplus, okay? I think that's the, that's a, an important insight uh, from you know, this, this fundamental kind of Marxist class analysis, which is, you know, as long as there's a surplus, there's going to be some kind of debate, tension, discourse, or struggle over how that surplus is used, right? Um, so the, the collective was allowed to sell any surplus above their quota on the private market. So now, usually, this is at a much higher price. So they're trying to preserve that incentive structure for, for the, the communes because the, the communes were, were their own enterprise, right? And, and they recognized that, you know, the, the workers themselves uh, who are in agriculture, um, you know, they, they have to make a lot of the decisions. They, they are the ones at the point of production, right? And they their actions uh, have consequences, right? They, they could either be producing more or producing less, right? Depending on what they do. So they try to set the quotas realistic, uh, rel you know, rel relative to what they think that, uh, you know, each, each uh, collective farm can produce. Um, but then, you know, they, they can also produce more. Now, 
The other thing that they allowed was they allowed for individual members uh, could also create and form their own private plots, right? And that output would belong to the individual, okay? Uh, they could either consume it or they could sell it on the market as they choose, right? And that's different from the output uh, that's produced collectively, of course, right? That belongs to the collective. So you have a very interesting uh, set of policies creating a kind of conflict here uh, within the collective farms, right? And the, the, the conflict is between the communal fundamental class process and the ancient fundamental class process. Now, the state took a large proportion of the total crop uh, produced by the collective farms, um, but they didn't take the majority of it, right? This is, this is interesting, okay? So here's the average uh, portion of the gross crop yield that, that's, that's taken by the state, okay, in the form of these, of these quotas. Um, so we can see that it's, you know, somewhere between, you know, in the, during this period, right, somewhere between about 30 and 40 percent, right? Now, if we consider what are the prices, uh, what are the agricultural prices here, uh, and we're using a, an index, uh, you know, to, to put all of these in, in terms of the same units uh, and to abstract from, you know, other price changes and so forth, okay? So, and we're doing this in order to compare the prices that are available to these two different class processes, okay? The, the communal or the communist and the ancient, which are both taking place within the same farm, right, but with, within the same enterprise, okay? So initially, right, in 1928, when, when collectivization is, is just beginning, um, these, they, they haven't really set up the, the price system, okay? So these prices are at, are at parity. Um, then, as they as they develop the policies uh, that I mentioned, what we find is that prices for the goods produced in the collective farms uh, fall. Right. So, look at this. That means what you got a uh, dollar for before, right, has now fallen to seventy two cents. Right. And then it falls further to fifty three cents, to thirty cents, to thirteen cents. Wow. Right. So. You know, the, the, the state is, again, using their control over prices, their central control over prices, to extract more of the surplus from the communal class process in agriculture. Meanwhile, in terms of, you know, the ancient fundamental class process, you know, what, what uh, the, the um, ancient farmers, you know, if they produce on their, on their own private plot. Now, this is up to them, right? There's... That's just an option. But of course, many uh, did it because you can see, right, these prices increase. So again, what was what would have gotten you a dollar in 1928 gets you $3.55. That is, you could earn a much more producing on these small plots. Uh, and what the farmers did, of course, is they produced the highest value and most labor-intensive uh, crops that they could on their own plots because these are the output of that is often uh, even higher priced, right? So, you know, things like meat and dairy and so forth, or or, or uh, perishable vegetables or fruits or things like this, right? Um, now, these are high labor crops anyway, right? The 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 large scale uh, grain farming, the thing that the state is really concerned with, that that's the collective part. Okay, so. You know, it's it's different crops here. It's not the same crops, is my point. Um, so and now look at this statistic, right? Well, by by 1940, uh, a, a kilo of grain sold on a private market would fetch over 27 times uh, what the what the you know state controlled price, what the collective farm would receive. So really, pretty huge difference there. Here's a diagram which just sketches out the contradictions between the state capitalism in, in, in industry uh, and the the collective farms uh, called uh, Kokosi. We're, we're, we're often seen as conflicts between the state-owned socialist versus the privately owned. So that is, they didn't see it as a conflict between state capitalism and the communal fundamental class processes, as I'm sketching it here, right? They, they saw it as a conflict between state versus private, okay? Um, 
So in order to attenuate that, they had an idea, maybe we will create some state-owned collective farms, right? That is, the collective farms were, were actually, to the extent that anything is owned, right, in, in the Soviet Union, you know, where, where land uh, was owned by the state and so forth. But because the, the workers themselves owned and controlled, they were the first receivers of the surplus in agriculture, um, they're the ones who made the decision, right? So the, the Soviets said, well, maybe that's a problem, right? We, maybe we need to create some, some state-owned collective farms, uh, Sovkozy, uh, and in order to, to attempt to deal with that, all right? So here's what we, what we have, right? We have contradictions here emerging between the state capitalist fundamental class process in, in manufacturing, between the, the private communal fundamental class process in agriculture, in between the private ancient fundamental class process in agriculture. So a lot of contradictions going on here. So again, collectivization represents the largest single instance of the communal fundamental class process in Soviet history by far, right? In Russian history, maybe in the history of the world up to that point, probably, right? Um, but it was not recognized uh, in class terms uh, by Soviets or others at the time. You know, they. They just saw these as different aspects of um, of socialism, right? Again, they they saw it as state versus private, but they didn't really see it as uh, you know a, a a struggle over the surplus necessarily, right? Now, the communal fundamental class process, though it grew a lot in agriculture, still not dominant in society as a whole. Um, you know, again, state capitalism prevailed in manufacturing. That is. The workers themselves did not appropriate the surplus. Uh, that's very clear, right? In, in manufacturing, uh, the workers did not receive the surplus first. They did not were not in a position to make decisions about the surplus. They they were not the appropriators, right? Um, they uh, and you know the cities are uh, areas where uh, the state had much greater control, right? Because of you know it's a natural kind of centralization. Most manufacturing occurs in the cities. Uh, um, and, and then when we look at households, we find there is a feudal fundamental class process in households, as, as Resnick and Wolf argue in their other, uh, their other work. All right, so let's talk about some of the, the tensions and, and contradictions that, that uh, exist in terms of the collectivization of agriculture. Um, now, when, when agriculture is first collectivized, these small capitalist farmers, the kulaks, uh, and ancient farmers um, sometimes led protests and revolts. Now, not all of them did, right? This is a minority uh, activity, but it's serious enough so that it's of great concern uh, to the Soviet authorities. Some of these protests uh, involve sabotaging agricultural pro productivity, slaughtering and consuming livestock, uh, even burning down farms or, you know, destroying and hiding grain stocks, etc., right? Um, so, you know, a lot of struggle goes on over collectivization. Um, there are, you know, myths and things, uh, you know, that that say that uh, all property is going to be uh, abolished, and you know that that um, that your wife is going to be now be the property of the entire collective. I mean, you know, nonsense things that no no one was planning or even talking about, but they nonetheless the rumors spread like wildfire, right? So. Um, uh, now, the peasant farmers had been promised land by the Bolsheviks as, as part of their, you know, struggle to gain political power, uh, and the land had been granted, and the perception is now that it's being taken away um, to, to do collectivization, uh, and, you know, the revolts are punished forcibly, there's, you know, the, the, uh, this is part of the, the rise of, of the Stalin state, the you know, secret police and, and gulags. Now, the gulags had actually uh, existed, of course, under the czar uh, and were quite brutal under, under the czar. Um, uh, but, you know, people are now sent to them uh, for, uh, for crimes against the state related to, you know, hiding or sabotaging grain and so forth. Um, uh, and, uh, and millions perished uh, in this conflict uh, along with a severe famine uh, in 1932 and 1933. I'm going to discuss this in a separate lecture because this is another, uh, you know, very politically uh, sensitive topic. So just as an indicator, let's look at the, the um, number of livestock uh, in the Soviet Union. 
uh, between these these you know these different time periods this is data that we that we have here 1928 1941 and 1950 um, so we, we can see in, in some of these cases uh, you know there there is a decline okay so the uh, number of cows uh, declines uh, as does the number of sheep number of, of pigs isn't isn't much of a change um, now with horses, there's a pretty steep decline, but that probably owes at least something to uh, a replacement, you know, new technology being used in farming, moving away from, from horsepower and toward tractor power. All right, so this chart just indicates the, the speed at which collectivization occurred. So, you know, looking at 1927, uh, you know, there's a relatively small number of collective farms, but by the time we get to to 1930, there's many times more. Okay, so and by 1935, 90% uh, of agriculture was was collectivized. In 1928, uh, the the total of all farms, right, the total amount of land that is used here is 113 million hectares. Uh, and in by 1940, they have brought more land under cultivation. Okay, so there's there's a greater uh, number of hectares there. Uh, now, in 1928, a very small percentage of farms were uh, state collective farms, only 1.5%, uh, and only 1.2% uh, were, were uh, the private collective farms, the Kolkazi. Um, and there was a small number of these household plots because, you know, there are a few uh, uh, these, of these uh, collective farms at this point. Most of, of it, the overwhelming majority, uh, was you know peasant farms and and other uses, uh, and that uh, is abruptly reversed, uh, right? So we go towards you know the the thing that dominates here, right, is the private collective farms. Um, we do have some state-owned collective farms, but they're a small minority, um, and then this represents the land that's under cultivation in these these household plots, these individual plots. Okay, so we can see it's a very small proportion of the total land, uh, right, that's set aside for for individuals to use or households to use. All right, if we look at what is the the productivity of the collective farms, uh, now this chart looks at productivity, you know, relative to itself, right? So it, it's not looking back before uh, collectivization had, had occurred, right? Uh, the collective farms were on the whole much more productive than the small farms they displaced. Uh, so Collectivization was, in that sense, quite successful. Uh, more on that in a bit. Uh, but what we what we saw is that productivity initially fell somewhat. So you know, look at this, right? We productivity fell by about fifteen percent going from nineteen twenty eight to nineteen thirty four, uh, and this is probably due to the resistance uh, to collectivization. Uh, also, there's a famine in here, right? Uh, nineteen thirty one, nineteen thirty three. Um, well, 1932, 1933. Uh, but then productivity after it, it bottomed out here in 1934, uh, it's, it increased, but kind of unevenly. Okay, So by the end of this period, and once you know collectivization had been kind of fully in place, we, if we find that the farms were, were slightly more productive uh, than they were at the beginning. Okay. But this does this is a success because there's a lot more land under cultivation at this point, right? So more, uh, you know, the the just the land mass that's that's being farmed is is greater, uh, you know, about about forty percent greater, um, and it's it's more productive as well. Now, because state policy demanded large portions of the surplus from the communal farms, uh, farmers increasingly turned to the ancient fundamental class process, that is, their private plots. Uh, to maintain living standards and or just supplement their income, right? I mean, there's all kinds of reasons why you want, you might want to have more income. In this next section, I'm just going to address some of the common criticisms uh, of Soviet agriculture uh, because I think, you know, a, a lot of this is just heavily biased uh, and, and a lot of the criticisms are pretty illogical. Um, and my thinking here is, is, quite influenced by uh, the work of Joseph Medley, who, who wrote an article called Soviet Agriculture, a critique of the myths constructed by Western critics. Um, so here's a common uh, view here to say, look, the crop yields were low. Uh, crop yields per hectare were only 54% of the United States. 
Now, this is very common to, to compare Soviet agriculture to the United States, which is a pretty unfair, uh, unrealistic comparison for a bunch of reasons. Uh, so the Soviet Union has a very different climate, very different geography, soil fertility uh, than the U.S. You know, the, the U.S. is in a lot of ways the perfect place uh, to, to grow grain. I mean, just, you know, the, the grain producing uh, regions in the United States uh, are just really ideally, um, you know, uh, situated uh, to do the kind of mass production of grain um, much better suited than, uh, you know, the, the geography and climate of, of, of the Soviet Union, which has a much smaller area of good land for growing grain. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good comparison to, to use the United States. If you, if you used similar uh, areas of Europe that have similar climate and geography, then you find, well, there's, the yields are actually pretty similar to that, right? Um, uh, so here's a quote here. The conditions of soil and climate, levels of capital stock and choice of techniques together with the use of fertilizer and irrigation are key factors. For example, the Soviet cotton yield habitually runs some 50% higher than that of the United States. Over a six-year period from 1973 to 78, the average East German wheat yield was 4.09 metric tons per hectare versus 2.03 for the U.S. Agricultural performance cannot be judged by yields alone, or else we'd be forced to conclude that Eastern European performance is superior to the U.S. Okay, another uh, common criticism you hear here is that the productivity per worker is much lower than the United States and that Soviet farmers produced about 13% of the value of the U.S. per person. Um, and again, this is not a very good comparison uh, because, you know, it, it uh, farms in the, in the United States use vastly more capital, use, they use more land, and they use more fertilizer and other agricultural inputs per person uh, than did the, the Soviet Union. So here's a table which looks at agricultural inputs per worker uh, and compares the Soviet Union to the United States. And again, we find, you know, this significantly more tractors per person, uh, not surprisingly, right, using the United States versus the Soviet Union in 1977. Um, more, much more horsepower, right? So they're, they're using more tractors. The tractors are also more powerful, right? Um, they use far more trucks, right? I mean, it's an order of magnitude difference here, right, in terms of the, the, the capital in, in the form of, of tractors and trucks, uh, that are used in the United States versus the Soviet, right? So, and there's also a lot more land per per worker. Okay, so you, I'll be getting the picture here, right? Large plots of land, large powerful agricultural machines. That's the difference between the United States and the Soviet Union. And of of course, you're going to expect higher productivity. I mean, if you didn't get higher productivity with all those inputs, then the inputs would be better spent elsewhere, right? I mean, there's a reason why. Uh, you know, agriculture is organized as it is in the United States, right? The, now, if we control for the inputs, the productivity dis differences disappear, okay? So this is a kind of basic uh, thing, you know, that you have to control for differences in inputs. I mean, that's basic agricultural economics, right? So to, to have critics of agriculture not do that, uh, you know, is just either very sloppy or very biased. I don't. I don't know which, right? But uh, now here's a here's a maybe slightly more sophisticated critique. Okay, which is where critics say these private pl plots produce 23 percent of the total agricultural output, uh, but used only 2.7 percent of the land. And the conclusion that these critics drew was they said, well, so socialist agriculture, meaning the collective part of the farm, right, is less productive than capitalist agriculture. And by that, they meant these private plots. Uh, now, this is already very problematic, okay? Because it's not enough, when, it, when an individual farmer is producing for the market, that is not enough to call that capitalist, okay? So individual farmers have been producing for the market for literally thousands of years, okay? It does not necessarily make them capitalist, right? Uh, that is far, far older than capitalism. And, you know, as Resnick and Wolf have shown, uh, the private plots, again, they're an instance of the ancient fundamental class process, not of capitalism. These, these are not 
uh, farmers are not working for a wage. They they do not have that kind of uh, relationship um, that that is indicative of the capitalist fundamental class process. Now, as as Medley points out, uh, these private plots produced 58% of the nation's potatoes, 29% of its vegetables, 54% of its fruits and berries, 28% of its meat, and 20% and 20 of its milk. Um, now, these ancient fundamental class process of you know production of, of meat and dairy products and so forth on these private plots actually relies fairly heavily on indirect subsidies from the communal fundamental class process. That is, you know, how do you raise uh, meat and, and dairy? Well, you, you have to have, you know, cows, uh, sheep, pigs, etc. right? I mean, you know, what do you feed them, right? You're going to feed them grain. Uh, and it turns out that over 60% of the grain grown in the, you know, that's in the, the communal fundamental class process is being used to feed livestock. So that is, they're getting a very heavy subsidy from the communal fundamental class process. It is going to subsidize the production of, of meat and dairy products, which are then sold in the private market, both because they're very high value uh, products, right? But they're also labor intensive, right? Um, and so this smaller amount of land, right? See, land is not land, right? It's not acre per acre. That's not really the relevant comparison, right? It's what are you growing on that? What are you, what are you producing on that? How much value does it have? Okay, so this to produce this these labor intensive crops and products requires about forty percent of the total labor time in agriculture, right? So, okay, well that makes a little bit more sense, right? When we when we use the the proper context, right, the proper comparison, uh, and it's not like well, oh, the capitalist is so much better than the socialist. I mean, that's that's nonsense. So it's kind of a related criticism here to say that Soviet farmers earned a large portion of their income, about fifty six percent, from their private plots. Uh, and again, the critics tend to see these as as capitalist. I have dispensed with that argument. I think, uh, as opposed to from the collective farm, that's you know about thirty seven percent. So you know, again, in class terms, what's going on here is to cope with the ex extraction of surplus from the communal fundamental class process, the members of these collective farms turned to their private plots. They cultivated the highest value, most labor-intensive crops that they could, meat, dairy, vegetables, etc. Um, agricultural output is in terms of prices. Okay, So the higher value per unit products, such as meat, have a much greater impact uh, than, for example, grain, which is relatively low value per unit, right? Like think about, you know, how much does a, a you know, a pound of, of grain cost versus a pound of meat, right? I mean, the, the meat is much, much more expensive, right? Much higher value, okay? Um, the ancient fundamental class process supported the communal fundamental class process by supporting the incomes of the members, right? But the support was only necessary because the state followed policies which drained much of the surplus from agriculture, right? Again, the terms of trade here, right? The terms of trade were very much against agriculture. Um, uh, because prices were so much higher in private markets, which could only be accessed via the ancient fundamental class process, then that funneled income toward that, okay? That, again, creates a conflict, a, uh, a contradiction between a communal and the ancient fundamental class processes in agriculture. Now, some of the critics will will say, you know, using as a criticism to say the Soviet Union was a large grain importer. Um, and uh, to quote Medley on this, right, an economic system is not inefficient because it imports, okay? Um, the, the European community, for example, uh, in 1987 was a net importer of some $25.8 billion of agricultural products, okay? That is almost double the 12.9 billion of net Soviet agricultural imports. Even when the larger population uh, uh, of the European community is discounted, the net per capita agricultural imports uh, of the EC exceeded those of the USSR by over 75%. One can't simply conclude from this that the small capitalist family farms of Western Europe are less efficient than the large socialist farms of the USSR. Um, now, we also find that much of the grain imports were due to the need to feed a, a larger number of livestock due to the increased demand for meat. Um, 
these basically these are choices, right? Um, to to you know the Soviets produced a lot of grain and they imported even more because they could, right? Um, why did they want to import more grain? Well, because people demanded even more meat and dairy, right? Uh, why? Well, because they like to eat it, you know? I mean, that's <laughs> that's a perfectly valid choice, right? Um, that doesn't mean anything really about the productivity of their agriculture. Uh, all it says is that they became a wealthy society that could, uh, you know, afford to, uh, to have, to eat more high value foods. That's all. All right. So clearly the, the state policy for collective farms, uh, was, you know, to increase agricultural raw materials to industry, uh, and food for a growing industrial labor force. The means was a large scale monocrop system. Okay. Um, which also produced raw materials for agriculture that, you know, grain and hay. Now let's, let's consider what are the, what's the official kind of account uh, of the results of, of collectivization. So uh, again, back to Stalin, um, the grain harvest increased from 4.8 billion poods, uh, a little bit of a strange measure here, a pood is 36.11 pounds, uh, in, in 1913, to 6.8 billion poods in 1937. Um, the raw cotton crop from 44 million poods to 154 million poods. Uh, the flax crop, that is fiber to produce various things, this uh, uh, from 19 million poods to 31 million poods. The sugar beet crop from 654 million poods to 1.311 billion poods and the oil seed crop from 129 million poods to 306 million poods. Uh, so, you know, they saw, like I said, dramatic increases uh, in output for a lot of the crops that they're very concerned with, right? These are crops which are both very important for food, uh, but also uh, raw materials, uh, especially raw materials to fuel industry. Uh, it should be mentioned that in 1937, the collective farms alone, without the state farms, produced a marketable surplus of over 1.7 billion poods of grain, which was at least 400 million poods more than the landlords, kulaks, and peasants together marketed in 1913. Okay, so again, a significant increase. Why? Because they reorganized agriculture and they, they poured resources uh, into, uh, into producing more, but they also extracted quite a bit from agriculture using that to, to fuel industrialization. So uh, here's graphs which just summarize visually uh, what was in the text before. Um, so grain, cotton, flax, uh, sugar beets, uh, oil seeds, okay? So, and again, the Soviets were focused on these crops because, you know, grain, sugar beets, their food and agricultural inputs, um, cotton, flax, and oil seed crops are raw materials for industry. So. Uh, those were the, these are uh, not the only crops that they produced, right? But they're, they're ones that they were very concerned with. And here's, here's crop yields. Okay. Looking at, uh, different periods. Okay. Going from the, the pre-Soviet period right here, uh, to the, you know, afterwards. Okay. And we, we see, uh, you know, a lot of increases going on here, right? Um, so, you know, whether we look at grain or cotton, beets, potatoes, vegetables, uh, you know, the yields per hectare steadily rose, uh, you know, throughout the Soviet period with the exception of potatoes, which is kind of stagnant during this period, right? But, but everything else uh, is, you know, uh, shows pretty solid growth throughout this whole period. So I think a, a reasonable conclusion here would be to say that Soviet agriculture seems to have met its goals. Uh, rising productivity, increased production of food and raw materials, grain, cotton, oil seed, etc., uh, and their other goal was to avoid the development of capitalism in agriculture, right? The, they, they did not want to see uh, agriculture become, uh, you know, have all of the problems of, of capitalist agriculture. That is, that some become rich and then exploit those who are, you know, less fortunate uh, and so forth. But the main thing is they, they increased uh, the production of surpluses, which then fueled industrialization in the cities. So how do we assess these, these, the performance of these collective farms? Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's the largest single uh, instance of the communal fundamental class process in history up to this point. Um, uh, they are, they were very productive, they were effective, large-scale agricultural producers 
uh, very much a success in economic terms. Um, though they were lacking in exploitation, right, because communal fundamental class process does not involve somebody else taking the surplus, they were not free of contradictions, okay? Um, there were conflicts with the state over the surplus, and that undermined the communal fundamental class process and tended to favor the ancient fundamental class process. Uh, all right, so that's my lecture. Thank you very much.